My name is Jeremy Nelson. I'm our Senior Director of Extended Reality, Media Design and Production. I'm very excited and delighted to welcome you to our Innovation Insights event. At the Center for Academic Innovation, it is our mission to collaborate across campus and around the world to create equitable, lifelong educational opportunities for learners everywhere. Through our Innovation Insights series, we invite faculty, innovators, and leaders from across the higher education and industry to join our campus community to share knowledge that advances student success and equity and inspires innovative and impactful teaching and learning. This fall, we have already heard from expert guests about innovative learning platforms and innovations in academic credentials. Today is very special for us and for me personally uh, as we delve into the fascinating and expansive realm of virtual reality and its applications in higher education. The promise of VR technology has been around for many years and it can support incredible learning experiences, but it is not magic. So how do we think about when and where to appropriately deploy it? Well, our guest today, Jeremy Balenson, the founding director of Stanford University's Virtual Human Interaction Lab and a leading authority on the psychology of virtual reality technologies, has thought deeply about this and I am excited to hear his thoughts and experiences. We're grateful to have Jeremy here with us at the historic Michigan Union today and a return home to a proud alum. Uh, it's been a while since you've been back, it sounded like. 33 years. <laughs> uh, still, still feels like home though, right? <laughs> Jeremy earned a BA from the University of Michigan in 1994 and a PhD in Cognitive Psychology from Northwestern University in 1999. He studies the psychology of virtual and augmented reality, in particular how virtual experiences lead to changes in perception of self and others. He is the recipient of the Dean's Award for Distinguished Teaching at Stanford. In 2020, IEEE recognized his work with the Virtual Augmented Reality Technical Achievement Award. He's gonna share his remarks with us and we'll save a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. So please get your questions ready. Please join me in welcoming Jeremy Balenson. <laughs> Thank you. Jeremy, can you start my time yep. up, please? Thank you. So absolutely thrilling to be here. Uh, I, I, don't, I just can't describe what it means to come back to the place where you got your undergraduate degree and to get to come give a talk like this and to have so many incredible people here. So thank you all for being here. Uh, Jeremy, thank you for hosting this talk. More importantly, thank you for the work you do. Jeremy Nelson uh, and the Center for Academic uh, Innovation here, they are changing how universities and other organizations view VR. So when people ask me, Jeremy, how do we put VR into our organization? whether it's a company or university, I say, well, you gotta go call Jeremy Nelson because he's uh, been running VR at a huge organization. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Okay. So today what we're gonna do is I'm gonna talk about VR as a medium, kind of where we're at today. We're then gonna talk about what's horrible about the medium and what we should avoid. <laughs> I'm then gonna present my framework called DICE, which is how you should think about integrating VR into your work and play life and we're gonna focus on epic wins, the things, low-hanging fruit of things we can do that really change people for the better. A show of hands, how many people have done VR before? How many people have not? Okay, uh, go see Jeremy Nelson for the four of you that said no, and he'll, he'll give you a tour afterwards. So I've been studying VR for 25 years now, and when Jeremy graciously agreed to host this talk, I really wanted to redo my talk. You know, speakers, we have a stock talk and, and we go through them and I wanted this to really be kind of a 25 year journey focusing on things we do now uh, and things we did 25 years ago. So when I first started, uh, headsets cost $25,000, $30,000. Um, there was about a couple hundred of them on the planet. Uh, when they broke, we had to send it back to Boston, uh, three or four weeks shipping and come back and we were out of business. Uh, it took a dedicated engineer to run the rooms. VR was rare and VR was hard. Now, we've got millions of them. So conservatively, there's about 30 million headsets sitting around in the United States, about one for every 30 people, okay? 90% of them uh, in the year 2022 were sold by social media companies. So in 2022, there was about 9 million headsets sold, and of those, almost every one was sold by either Facebook, uh, Meta, or ByteDance, uh, who owns TikTok. And so one of the themes for today is that when I grew up with VR, it was a piece of hardware. 
You put it on your head and you have this experience. It's now tied to a social media ecosystem, and that's a very different thing. Now, of those who said, raise your hand, you've done VR, how many have done VR this week? Yeah, yeah. So 100 people raised their hand, had done VR. Only eight of you had done it this week. And the challenge with VR today is of the 30 million headsets in the United States, they're all collecting dust. I'm going to tell you a secret. I haven't done VR in probably three weeks myself. And I study VR and think about it all day. And so uh, this is Popper. Okay, Popper uh, passed away recently. Uh, but he was 91 when we took this photo, and he put it on, and he said, Jeremy, this is kind of cool, but what am I supposed to do in here? <laughs> and a lot of people have that reaction, which is why so many of you have tried VR, but not this week. How many have done VR today? Yeah. And I'm not going to ask you to, if you use your phone today, because we've all used our phones today. Right? So what I'm going to do is talk about why it is that VR doesn't work as an everyday medium. And so we're going to start by talking about the downsides of VR. The first one is distraction. Okay? <laughs> VR is the most distracting medium ever invented. It blocks what you see, it blocks what you hear, and yet you're walking around or sitting in public and you can no longer perceive the outside world. And so when we think about VR as the problems of this medium, if you hashtag VR fail, you'll see hundreds of videos of people walking into TVs, stepping on the dog, punching uh, their counterpart who's not in VR. And it's an incredibly distracting medium. And it's going, that, that part of it is challenging. So we've only had one death as far as I know in VR. Uh, a man in Moscow, while playing a video game, fell through a plate glass table and bled to death. Um, but the challenge of having a medium that makes it so you can't see and hear the real world is not going away anytime soon. <laughs> you may think that nobody would drive while wearing a headset, but how many have heard of a game called Pokemon Go? <laughs> Pokemon Go is a game where you drive around or walk around through your smartphone camera and you catch these little video game guys. Uh, we know, we know hundreds and hundreds of people have been killed while playing Pokemon Go. There's an incredible study out of the University of Indiana that analyzes spots where the Pokemon are and looks at car accidents as a function of people who are driving their cars. So we know um, people are willing to use VR while driving. And in fact, uh, Facebook, in collaboration with a Swedish company called Varjo, has recently celebrated uh, the ability to use the pass-through video of the headset to drive a car. So whenever I give a talk and I've got really important people in the room, I say, let's not put headsets in cars. So will everybody agree to that? Yes? <laughs> it's a contract. It's a contract. <laughs> when we think about VR, we think about addiction. So very little research on this, but when the world is perfect and every party you've ever been to now feels like a party, it's not social media, but you look perfect, everybody loves you, uh, how do we ever go to the real world? And so we think a lot about this, though, real lack of research. Um, simulator sickness. How many people gotten dizzy while wearing a headset? Yeah, you probably did the roller coaster. Why are we putting on a roller coaster in VR? Um, <laughs> simulator sickness is a real thing. Uh, in my lab, we've probably put 20, 30,000 people through VR over the years. Even under the best of circumstances, the best hardware, no latency, camera doesn't move about one in 25 people get sick. And so it's a challenge. Uh, and I myself have something called benign paradoxical positional vertigo. I get dizzy really quick, um, which is why in my lab we've got a 30 minute rule. It used to be a 20 minute rule, but uh, um, latency is so good on headsets now, we made it a 30 minute rule. But after 30 minutes, take that headset off, touch a wall, drink some water, talk to a human being. Reality blurring. So Catherine Segovia uh, ran some early studies where she had kids come to the lab and the kids would put on a headset and they would do something fantastical. They'd swim with whales. We'd bring them back a week later and say, hey, have you ever you know, gone to SeaWorld and swim with whales? And her study, small sample study, and her study, half of the kids who went in VR uh, and swam with whales thought they had physically been to SeaWorld, would describe the hot dog they had before going in the water. Uh, we know reality blurring is a thing. Um, uh, there's an amazing study from 2014 out of Germany. Uh, Frank Steinke spent 24 hours in VR and his graduate student, Gerd Bruder, uh, took care of him and took all sorts of measures constantly. And one of the things Frank says that at some point through the experience, 
he just stopped understanding what was real, what was happening in the real world, and what was in VR. And so we think a lot about long-term use uh, and how it's going to affect what people think are real. Misinformation. So there's an incredible student in my lab, James Gardner Brown, who was a former military uh, information officer. And he's been working for years now on what happens when you get misinformation. Instead of a five-word blurb on Twitter, it's a VR experience. And what I'm showing you here is a screenshot of a world that we've built but not shared with the world, which is, it's amazing. You put on the headset, and you're on the moon. I mean, you experience such awe. It's the moon, and you're walking around, and you're seeing this lander. And then you hear something behind you. And you turn around. It's spatialized sound. And what you see is the stage and the set. And you learn that the moon landing wasn't real, but in fact, there's people filming it. You walk over to the craft table, and you get yourself a snack. Uh, and it's this idea of experiencing a conspiracy theory that the lunar landing wasn't real. And I'll tell you, uh, as equal the awe of being on the moon, the counterpart to that was the nagging experience that it wasn't real. So we're thinking a lot about that and thinking about how to defend against misinformation once it goes into VR. A lot of people ask about VR and kids. Um, I've got a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old across their lives. They've probably spent maybe six hours total in VR over the, all their lifetime. Um, what I'm going to show you is a video from Jackie Bailey. Uh, Jackie is a professor now at the University of Texas, and she's run more little kids through VR than anyone I know. So um, her dissertation was sponsored by Sesame Street, Sesame Workshop. Uh, and she ran hundreds and hundreds of kids who were three years old, four years old, and five year old through VR. They'd put on the headset and they'd meet Grover, and this is what it looks like. Okay, so here's the good news. The good news with hundreds of kids run, nobody got their eyes ruined. Nobody cried and called for their parents. We didn't get uh, angry phone calls weeks later because the kids were having nightmares. So if your kid is supervised by a parent and is meeting Grover in VR for five minutes, everything's fine. Um, on the other hand, what, ja what Jackie studies is how VR can be more influential on kids compared to other media. And so she looks at three things. The first thing she looks at is compliance. So he says, uh, dance with me, follow my every move. Um, he asks you to step forward. You're either seeing Grover in VR or on TV. And she studies how your reactions change. And what she shows, kids are more likely to obey, to comply to Grover's request when you meet them in VR compared to on TV. She also looks at behavior after VR is over. And so we give the kids 10 stickers. And we say to them, and five-year-olds, they love stickers. We say, here's 10 stickers. You can have these. You can take them home. or." If you give some to Grover, Grover really loves stickers, you can, he can, you can give them to him, but you can't take those home. Kids give Grover more stickers when they met him in VR compared to when they meet him on TV. So we could talk more about this work. Uh, I've written a report for Common Sense Media, VR 101, what parents uh, need to know about kids. It's free to download. Um, in general, VR is fine for kids as long as you know what they're doing, you're with them, and it's short. So. I've spent 12 minutes talking about the downsides of VR. We're going to be really positive from here on out. But I hope you all agree <laughs> that VR is not f something that we should be using all the time. I didn't even talk about privacy and all sorts of other issues that we could talk about. Hence, we're going to talk about a DICE model, which is let's save VR. We know VR is special. You, there's a budget for it, right? You get dizzy. Reality gets blurred. There's all sorts of things to think about. Let's save VR for things that if you did them in the real world, would be dangerous, impossible, counterproductive, or expensive. And we're going to go over each of those individually. But another way of saying this is this is a picture of Apple, uh, their new Vision, uh, what do they call it, the Vision Pro. Uh, they have a video promo. I would say about half of their video promo is people putting on a headset to look at a website or to watch a 2D video. Uh, and in my opinion, uh, apologies to my colleagues at Apple, I just don't think people should be putting on headsets to read their email. I don't think that's a good use of the time. So we can deliberate about that later, but let's save VR for dice. All right, let's start with dangerous. 
When we talk about VR for being dangerous things, we typically talk about training firefighters, right? It's a great example because firefighters, you can get burned while you're training and that those are amazing uses. We do a lot of my work in my lab. We work with the US military a lot. We train soldiers on how to uh, culturally understand places. We, there's a lot of great work on there. What I'm gonna talk about danger uh, is during shelter in place, it was dangerous to be around people. So if you've ever been to Stanford campus, you may recognize the oval or the amazing quad where they've got the circle of rodents. What you see here is a picture of my two daughters and one of my dogs. We went there, we were the only ones on campus. The grass was this high. They didn't mow the lawns at Stanford uh, during shelter in place. And at that time, it was dangerous to be around people. Also during that time, professors were scrambling. It was March 2020. We had to figure out, how are we going to teach next year? And so a lot of us are trying to figure out how to use Zoom. And what I decided to do was, can we figure out how to put my students in headsets instead of on Zoom? And so what began was a 15-month sprint. So I volunteered to teach in summer 2021. No one ever does that. We like to go on vacation then. Uh, <laughs> and I volunteered to teach. Uh, in summer because I was hoping that in that delay of 15 months that the hardware would get better, that the platforms would get better, that I actually could justify teaching in VR. So we had a 15-month scramble uh, and we actually figured out how to get VR into there. Uh, we created a Stanford metaverse that we've now used four times. Um, we've had uh, 500 students, just to give a perspective, is about 10% of the university. It would have been 30% if I would have had enough headsets. Uh, everybody wanted to take this class. And we had about 400,000 shared minutes together in VR over these four classes. Before I go on, uh, these students and staff members worked, I don't even want to know how many hours a day they worked for 15 months straight. Incredible. I'm often saying we here, uh, but really these folks, just a uh, stunning amount of work to pull off what was the biggest, uh, biggest feat of my work career. Uh, and I don't mean to brag about that, but we, they worked really hard. Versus Stanford bought us 250 headsets. Uh, and if you're going to try this at home, it takes a lot of work to get these headsets provisioned properly, to get them working. Uh, that was just, in terms of physical labor, ridiculous amount of work. We had to choose a platform. So when I start, started building VR in 1999, if I wanted to have two people together as avatars, I personally had to program, if they move their body forward, how you'd send the positive translation on Z over the network and render the avatar moving, you don't have to do that anymore. There's platforms. Uh, we looked at a lot of them. We decided to work with Engage, a uh, really incredible platform for teaching and learning. But uh, figuring out what platform is right for you is important. Um, we had to flip the classroom. So talk a little bit about educational theory here. So um, how many of you have heard the term flip classroom? OK, uh, about 10% of you. For many years, educational technologists and theorists have been saying, the model that I did at University of Michigan, uh, where I came here and I took a primate social behavior class, and all of us came here and sat in a 600-person lecture. The lecturer talked. We wrote stuff down feverishly and then went home. That model is silly. You should do that offline. Professors, we don't change our lectures that much year to year. Uh, you should see a recording of the lecture. And when you come together physically, you should do stuff. Right? You should do active, constructive, engaging learning. Um, that doesn't happen often for two reasons. Number one, professors, I want to say we're lazy, but we're busy, uh, and changing a curriculum <laughs> is hard. Uh, the second thing is that it's really hard to come up with something that's active and engaging for an hour and a half, twice a week. That's actually compelling. Uh, and so you see a lot of resistance to that. But we decided uh, that we were not going to use VR so that you'd see a talking head of me. Uh, I said earlier, I have a 30-minute rule. I don't believe VR is good for you to see me talking. So we had to figure out how to flip the classroom. And so what we did, Sunday, the kids did readings. The students did readings, excuse me. Monday, we would have a Q&A where I would just call on people randomly, and I'd ask them about the readings. Uh, they'd be prepared enough so they could answer that, and they'd written in advance. That was done on Zoom, by the way. We wouldn't do that in VR. On Wednesday, we took a VR journey. And so what's a VR journey? One week we would talk about medical VR and um, all my students would put headsets on and we would talk about paced breathing. Okay? So I'm 51 years old. I've never meditated in my life. Uh, everyone knows that I should. I'm a little bit hyper. Uh, <laughs> and so we went into Altspace VR and we met the Reverend Jeremy Nickel who led us, you can see our avatars, uh, in a paced breathing exercise on these platforms and the platforms rose up into outer space and we could look down at the earth and get the overview effect. Um, 
and there was something magical about being around other people, so there's pressure to do the paced breathing, but not to feel intimidated by real faces, real video. The avatars were just abstract enough to hit the sweet spot of I feel pressure to do the work, but I'm uninhibited enough that I'm actually willing to do these exercises. To put it in perspective, I would never in a million years do a face-to-face -face paced breathing exercise in my class. I'd be mortified, right? But something <laughs> about being in VR made it work. And so that's what we did for the medical week. Uh, on the week for education, imagine that everyone in this room put on a headset and we went to a spot together. And the spot we went to it was a blank, infinite virtual plane. And with the tools and engage, you can spawn 3D models. You can literally build blocks. The task would be, you know, we're going to build a city together. We're going to build the city of the future. And for an hour and a half, we worked together and constructed a city. Uh, active, you know, you would do stuff. And that was what the Wednesday journey was like. So after the Wednesday journey, on Thursday and Friday, we would have discussion section, just like we had here at University of Michigan, where 12 people would sit in a room or 14 people and get led by a TA. We would do that in VR. And now here's the part where I get a little bit um, less of a teacher and more of a researcher. Part of that 15-month journey was getting Stanford legal to approve a consent process where the students Every single move they made, every utterance they said, every thing they did action-wise with Engage, we recorded 60 times a second. Okay, so it took 15 months, lots of lawyers involved, lots of layers of consent. I can talk about it later on, but all the students in my classes agreed to allow me to record all of their data. And this was uh, just an incredible thing. So we'd have small group discussions, and why would you do small group discussions in VR? How does that fit with my DICE model? Well. When you look on the left, that's what it looks like for people who are engaged together. So they uh, were there, and when I look left, everybody sees me looking left. If I come over here to this gentleman, you see me getting closer to him. That's how the real world works. And that's how Engage works. Spatial communication is preserved, so if I'm looking at you, everyone else sees that I'm looking at you. On the other hand, Zoom, uh, the, those two people on the bottom, do you think they're actually looking at each other? <laughs> But the brain interprets that they are, right? They're not even looking at their camera or screen. They're looking at the mailman who's uh, walking by their window, right? Um, and so why we do this in VR is because it preserves the spatiality of communication. Now, for those who don't study VR tracking, uh, there's a really neat thing about it. In order to make VR work, we've got to track your hands and your head, the X, Y, Z, and the pitch all roll, translation and rotation, so that the world updates. So for when I step forward now, you all get bigger. To make VR work, you've got to track the movements in order to render, to display the scene properly. So we're able to dump all of that human body movement to a file and to study it. And so here's an example of one week. This is group 12. We had uh, 24 groups in our fall 2022 class. One week, uh, and there's six people and we're capturing all of their data um, 60 times a second, and, and every 60 of a second, we're capturing 19 things, X, Y, Z, pitch or roll of head and hands, and if their mouth is open or closed, it's a lot of nonverbal data. To put this in perspective, this is one week, and this is one class, okay? So we have eight weeks, we have 24 groups, and without, by a magnitude of order, this is the largest data set ever collected in history on human nonverbal behavior. And so we've got this amazing data set where we know how people are moving. Um, what do we do with that? We do all sorts of quantitative analysis of how people move. So this is a simple score called synchrony. Right now in this room, you are synchrony. You are with me. I love it. Thank you for paying such great attention. Our movements are correlated. When I'm walking over here, your heads are turning with me. It's called synchrony, and it's kind of the secret sauce of human communication when we're face to face is that our nonverbals are synced, and we can compute this mathematically. And the fun thing about my class is that in the history of understanding human body movement, it's rare to have what we call an input level how people move their bodies, and an output level, some measure that you can now say synchronous groups do well at. But remember, these students are in my class. We can look at their quiz scores that day. We can look at the amount of uh, collaboration, creativity they display. We've got quantitative measures where we can now take how they move their body, and for the first time at scale, we can build mathematical models of how somebody moving their head and you following that causes good collaboration to occur. In 1991 here at Michigan, 
I took a class from Ukyung An. Uh, it was a cognitive psych class, and we read a book called Unified Theories of Cognition. This is my favorite figure from any cognitive psych book ever written. Uh, it's by Alan Newell. And what it says is that humans, when you think about time in the brain, you can think about the biological band, which is milliseconds. You know, this is what happens with mirror neurons and automatic stuff. You can think of the cognitive band, where you're now thinking about, you know, 10 second chunks, which is making a decision very quickly. You can think about the rational band, which is, uh, you know, thinking about how I'm going to plan out some collaboration for a task for 30 minutes. And you can look at the so social band or the cultural band, which is, you know, a couple of months. In our data set, we have students that never met each other in these discussion sections. And over 10 weeks, their bonds form. So we can study quantitatively, as groups form, how do they non-verbally become synced? How does that relate with their outcomes? And it's, uh, it's an incredible data set. I'm, I'm going to move on from this. I could talk about it all day, but I, there's a lot I want to talk to you about. The one finding I want to highlight is that in VR, space is free. So can we just say how awesome this room is? <laughs> it's an awesome room. Imagine that you got to have three-person meetings in this room anytime you wanted. Right? In VR, you can. Right? Space is free. It's just a transform on the XZ plane. Uh, and so what Ugi Han, who is the lead author on a lot of this classwork, Ugi systematically manipulated how awe-inducing, how large indoor and outdoor spaces were. And what she finds in our classes in a very robust uh, uh, set of outcomes is that when you get to have small meetings in huge spaces, everything gets better well-being, collaboration, success. And so uh, I always laugh when I see the VR companies displaying these collaboration spaces and everybody's cramped in the small office just like they'd be in the real world. So uh, <laughs> the take-home finding here, make your space is huge. All right, we're going to switch from dangerous to impossible. Checking time here. Beautiful. So this is things in VR that you can do that you can't do in the real world. So we're going to highlight some early work by an incredible scholar named Nick Yi. Uh, Nick wanted to study when you wear an avatar, Nick was a gamer and he spent many, many hours a week. He was getting his PhD while playing probably 40 hours a week in World of Warcraft. Uh, <laughs> and, and by far the most prolific student that's in the history of the field of communication, in my humble opinion. Nick was brilliant and amazing. Um, he wanted it, but while he was playing those games, he found out that when he was occupying an avatar, his behavior would conform to that avatar a little bit. And so he wanted to study what would happen when people spent a lot of time in avatars that were different than their physical self. And we wanted to look at this in the context of empathy. So um, there's a theory in sociology, psychology called the contact hypothesis. And to really simplify things, if there's in-groups and out-groups, people from groups that don't get along, if they spend time together in a constructive context, they're going to learn to get along. I'm simplifying this drastically, but a lot of research from the 60s on uh, showing this, that when people spend time together, uh, they, they, they get along. The other theory we'll bring into this is something uh, that uh, we would call self-presence, but uh, scholars now call body transfer, which is if you put someone in VR and they're moving their body physically and they see that avatar moving with them, from a neuroscience standpoint, the brain starts to incorporate the new body as a part of the self. In other words, to, by wearing that body, the brain treats it as the actual self. So I'm going to show you an old movie. Uh, don't laugh at our graphics. Okay, This is uh, literally 20 years old. Um, so this is Nick's first Proteus study where he had people embody an avatar that was different. So he's walking around. Um, that headset cost uh, $30,000, by the way. Um, He's walking around, he comes to a mirror. In the study, he would spend about three or four minutes moving in front of the mirror. He turns his head, the avatar moves its head. Um, he puts his hands out, the avatar reaches with him. Um, now he bends down. We hit a button, he comes up, and he's now a woman of color. And what we study is when somebody occupies an avatar that's different from them, how does that change subsequently their behavior? Now, uh, here's when I want to pause uh, and say, VR is not a magic solution for racism. It does, a 10-minute media experience is not going to change the way we think about others. It doesn't solve sexism, ageism, all forms of prejudice. But we've been studying this for 20 years, um, dozens and dozens of studies out of my lab and many from the rest of the world. And uh, I would say in general, compared to other experiences you can give someone, wearing someone's body in VR, experiencing a situation that's a little bit hard, Others treat you in a way that's not so great based on who you are. Compared to control conditions, that tends to outperform how we behave towards others compared to other things. Now, it's not every study. 
Uh, and it's not, uh, again, I'm not saying we're saving the world here, but there's nice ways to think about this medium. So uh, let me give you an example. So this is the research of Fernanda Herrera. One of the things people tend to ask when we talk about these findings is, well, how long does it last? And does it work on real people, meaning not college students? No offense to the amazing college students <laughs> in the room. So Fernanda was incredibly brave. She's run studies now with about 2,000 people in them. And what Fernanda would do is she would uh, give you a VR experience. We always look to see what you do afterwards, what you do afterwards. Uh, and so in this instance, you're about to see becoming homeless. Um, it's an experience where we worked with a couple uh, homeless organizations in, in the Bay Area. We wanted to teach people that there were situational factors that can cause people to lose their homes. Uh, a great psychologist who we just lost at Stanford, his name is Lee Ross, he's coined something called the fundamental attribution error. What the fundamental attribution error is, when something bad happens to you, my brain automatically thinks it's your character. When something bad happens to me, I think it's situational. It wasn't my fault, it was a situation. And all of us do this all the time, and we do it in particular with people who are homeless. And so this simulation was designed uh, to show that there are situational factors that cause people to lose their homes. Um, and what Fernanda studied afterwards, in addition to the classic psychological things uh, that we tend to measure, Afterwards, we'd hand you a physical piece of paper. There was a referendum in California at the time, a proposition uh, to have your own personal income tax to support affordable housing measures. And we measured to see if you would sign it. Um, and uh, that's uh, what we said. Let me show you this experience. So you're living in your apartment. Uh, you, you lost your job. You're trying to sell things in order to make rent. Uh, you can't sell enough things, so you're trying to live in your car. That's illegal in California. The cops come. Uh, Intense moment there. You're now just trying to get some sleep on a bus, but that guy's messing with your stuff, and this guy won't let you sleep. And so it's a incredibly intense experience um, designed to just show you that it's situational factors. Um, and what Fernanda shows is that you're more likely to sign this a referendum compared to if you watched a video, compared to if you did what we do typically with empathy, which is imagining uh, that we were someone. It's called uh, mental imagery exercises, and she shows that these effects outperform controls. She also looks at the same people two months later and shows that these effects persist. So again, not uh, a solution to the world's problems, but it is a tool that can help. Um, you can have empathy not just to other people, but to yourself. Uh, this is the work of Hal Hirschfield, uh, who's now a professor at the business school at UCLA. Uh, Hal wanted to answer the question, how can you get people to defer gratification? Okay? So all of us can think about the great meal we're going to have, the cocktails in a couple hours, but can we think about if you deferred those activities to help you later on, can you do so? And it's incredibly hard. Uh, Hal did so in the context of retirement savings. So in the United States, it turns out people uh, in their 30s and 20s now are going to be impoverished when they're 65 because they're not putting enough money in the bank, uh, but they're going to live till they're 90, um, so it's going to be a really tough couple of years, and so we're trying to figure out how to get people to put more money in the bank. What Hal did, subjects came in, you scan them, produce an avatar, half the subjects went to that mirror and saw themselves as they are, half of them, we used an algorithm to age them, met their future self, uh, and got to see themselves in the mirror do body transfer of how they're going to look when they're 70 years old. Um, what Hal showed fairly resoundingly uh, in his academic work, which was published in the Journal of Market Research, an academic journal, was that compared to any control you can think of, this is dissertation work, people put more money in savings, 40 bucks in savings as opposed to taking 20 bucks now, compared to uh, control conditions. Now, the fun thing about being in Stanford, uh, at this point, our, our work's going to pivot a little bit from journal publication to use out in the world, is that you can work with companies, and I'm sure you can do that at Michigan too, but Stanford being in the Valley, we have an opportunity to work with companies. One of the first things we did in this is we worked with Bank of America, and we produced something called face retirement. Uh, and in this instance, your webcam scans your face, builds a 3D model of you, and when you form a B of A account, if you click yes to face retirement, we stick your future self in your online banking interface so that every decision you make about your finances, your future self is staring at you. <laughs> and the more money you put in savings, the more your future self smiles, okay? <laughs> and so this is an instance of a win-win. Uh, Stanford, uh, you know, people get their money into uh, retirement accounts and Bank of America has more money in their accounts. Um, I wanna highlight, um, can uh, Eric and Moiso, uh, are you in the room? Yep. Please stand up, Eric and Moiso. Thank you for all the work you did in this. Sorry to embarrass you. You can sit down right now. Give me a huge hand. 
So this project is called Thousand Cut Journey, and it's the genius of Professor Courtney Cogburn at Columbia who studies uh, racism and health. And we've been working on this for almost a decade now, um, just under a decade, eight years. And we decided we were going to build a module where uh, you can become a black male in VR and experience intense events as an elementary school kid where the teacher blames you for something you didn't do, as a teenager in a stop and frisk scene, and as an adult when you go into an, uh, an interview uh, and uh, the interviewee doesn't even see you, you're invisible to him. And so this is all based on Courtney's research and an incredible interdisciplinary team that worked, uh, before we touched a keyboard, we worked on the narrative on this narrative part of this for over a year. Um, Courtney, uh, in her incredible genius, was able to convince Columbia, where she's a professor, to make this part of uh, the mandatory incoming uh, master's student program and so we've got data that's coming out soon from a longitudinal program in which you know we can study how doing thousand cut journey when you accompany it with other types of education changes your attitudes and i can't talk about that data now but it's coming out soon why i asked eric and moisa to stand is that jeremy um, this is a really dense well, from a computational standpoint piece and it only runs on a pc with a cord to a headset uh, and jeremy moisa eric spent couple of years, two to three years, trying to economize all of the assets so that it could run on the Oculus Quest 2. As of two months, two months, mm -hmm. it's now free for you to download on the Oculus Quest 2 uh, and for you to think about. And again, this is a really intense piece. Uh, Courtney's put up instructions on how to onboard and offboard people on this. It's a really intense piece, uh, but I wanted to flag this for you and to thank our host from Michigan for putting in so much effort to make this free for people that want to use it. In the same mode, you can do things that are impossible, not just with your identity, but with your body. And so this is work uh, from Andy Andrea Stevenson Wan, who's now a professor at Cornell. And we brought in kids who have got chronic regional pain syndrome, CRPS. Horrible affliction for those that know someone that has it. You're in agony in your limbs. It's a brain thing, not a body thing. Uh, but the way to treat it is by moving your limbs. So it's one of those just horrible catch-22s. What we did is we would bring these patients in, and these are kids, eight, nine, ten years old, and uh, they'd be there with, with their physical therapist. They'd be crying. Uh, it's hard. It's hard to do this work. And so what we would give them was a little bit of what's called self-efficacy. And so the kids would be in VR. They'd look down at their leg. When they would move their knee, 20 degrees, we would put a gain factor so they'd see it moved 30. In other words, they'd see an exaggerated movement so they could get a sense of what they can do. Right? When you're taught to visualize while in pain, it's hard to visualize success because you're in agony. And it's hard to do these movements. And so for some of our kids, we would do what we call extended. We'd put a gain factor on it. Other kids were in such agony, they couldn't actually move the limb that was affected. And so we did limb swap. They would move their arms, look down, and see their legs move. So they would have agency to the movement as a preliminary step towards healing, um, but because they, even though they couldn't move their legs. And so uh, really nice use cases. Uh, one of the, when we talk about the, the epic wins in VR, physical therapy is, is by far uh, my favorite in the medical world. OK, we're going to shift now to counterproductive. Great on time. This is the idea of using VR for things that teach you an important lesson, makes you think about things differently, but if you did it in the real world, it would be a horrible thing to do. Okay? And I'm going to talk here about the work of Sun Ju An, uh, who has done lots of work in this area. And it's the idea of let's have you personally destroy the environment in certain ways, in certain principled ways according to research, so that you can feel that your actions that you do have consequences in the environment. And uh, in this study, we talk about um, cutting down trees if you use non-recycled toilet paper. So when you go to the supermarket, there's, you know, one in 10 brands will be recycled toilet paper. Um, if you're using non-recycled toilet paper, a fair amount of that pulp comes from virgin trees. These are trees that have been around for quite some time. We're literally cutting them down so that we can use toilet paper, right? Um, so how do you get people to think about non-recycled toilet paper? It's always a big argument in my family at home because, uh, you know, the other stuff's really good, right? Um, <laughs> So Grace took subjects uh, and had them go into VR or had them watch a video or had them read a story about what it would like to cut down a tree. And 
had them in the VR condition, you would cut down a tree, you'd feel haptic vibrations on your hand, the tree would fall and you'd feel your, your feet move, really intense experience of cutting down the tree, the birds all flew away, got quiet. And then she'd look about how much paper you'd use subsequently, and people use less paper when they're in VR compared to control conditions later on. So she's extended that work into lots of areas. I want to talk about a recent study done by a postdoc in my lab, Anna Queiroz, um, who ran one of the most incredibly ambitious studies in rural Brazil. So she brought VR, she basically, she, her colleagues had a mobile VR system with about 50 headsets and drove and boated and got to places in rural Brazil uh, and made VR part of the curriculum. And uh, there's lots of amazing things I could talk about with Anna's work here, but really I want to talk about this notion of self-efficacy, okay? VR for kids that can't do science, meaning there's no resources to do science, gives them this active ability, I can do science. I can physically walk up to uh, a sea snail and look at it and make an observation, and I can actively become a scientist. And so Anna's work, again, at a scale of 10,000 learners showing VR compared to control conditions, is having kids believe they can do science. So things she measures, you know, are you willing to take a class in chemistry next year? Probability goes up, all sorts of great measures, because the agency of being able to do things, you're not passively watching, you're doing things, increasing science. So, there's a piece called the Stanford Ocean Acidification Experience. It's free to download off Steam, uh, and it's something we worked on for seven years. It's uh, an incredible piece, I'm proud of it. Uh, you become a scientist, you understand this phenomenon called ocean acidification, you are collecting data, you're uh, doing chemistry, moving molecules around, and uh, we've run lots of studies on it showing that it causes more learning and more uh, advocacy on the behalf of climate change. But there's a problem, which is you've got to own a headset to do it. Uh, and that's, uh, what, what, there, there's anything we've learned over the last few years is that this hockey stick function of VR use, it isn't going to happen tomorrow, right? It's not gonna happen next week. It's, so it's gonna take a little time. So how do you get lots and lots of people together so that they can experience what it's like to understand climate change? And so I'm gonna talk about something I've never talked about publicly before. Um, this is the Madison Square Garden Sphere. Uh, in 2016, Jim Dolan, who owns Madison Square Garden, came to my lab and uh, did a bunch of these demos we're talking about today, and he had a, uh, an idea and a pitch for, can we do some amazing experience where you can bring lots of people together and let them experience these types of VR scenes together? Uh, and um, lots of kind of informal conversations up until two years ago where I started working with Madison Square Garden uh, on the sphere. And, um, we premiered two weeks ago. Uh, so how many have heard of this sphere? How many have heard of it because of you two? <laughs> how many have heard of it for Postcard on Earth by Darren Aronofsky? Okay, one of you, yep. So you two premiered uh, two weeks ago on Friday, three weeks ago on Friday. Uh, that Sunday, we premiered Postcard from Earth to 1,000 people, and then last week, we premiered it to 5,000 people. So Darren Aronofsky, brilliant filmmaker, has made a 50-minute experience where you are everywhere in the world and you experience humans decimating the planet and you're hearing about solutions. Now, uh, the Sphere has the largest screen ever made by humans. It's 16K resolution and the screen is four acres. Your chair vibrates. There's 170,000 speakers that make sounds move around. Uh, we bring you 60 mile per hour winds that carry scent, heat, moisture, and cool. It's one of the most incredible experiences. And uh, for those who have seen a Darren Ar Aronofsky film, uh, imagine Darren spending two years on making an incredible piece uh, that is designed to make you experience climate change. Uh, and it's just stunning. So I'll, I'll pause talking about this because we have other things to cover. But uh, Jim Dolan has figured out how to get 18,000 people into one place and have them experience VR climate change. Uh, it's not, uh, I, don't know if I, did, I don't know if I had that on my bingo card, but. Uh. <laughs> so we're gonna close with using VR for things that are just too expensive to do in the real world. Uh, training's always been the killer app for VR. So in 1929, Edwin Link said, let's make a flight simulator. Uh, the reason he made a flight simulator is because people learn by doing, by making mistakes, by getting feedback, and repeating. Try, fail, correct, repeat. That's how the brain wants to learn. Pretty expensive to do that in an airplane, right? 
Hence, you have the flight simulator. And what I'm going to talk about now is a bunch of work that takes that flight simulator model and brings it to other ways. Um, so in 2013, Derek Belch was a master student. He also had been previously the field goal kicker on the Stanford football team. Uh, Derek did his master student thesis in my lab, and he performed the Herculean task of convincing coach David Shaw, a brilliant forward-thinking coach, to donate a few minutes of practice time on Mondays. For those who don't know, coaches choreograph practice down to 30-second chunks. Coach Shaw gave us a couple of minutes where we would replace the quarterback with a 360 camera rig, which is really hard to do in 2013, and we would film some footage. Now, when the quarterback goes to the line of scrimmage, he's got two parameters he can change. He can keep the original play, or he can kill, 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 and go to the next play in the queue. He can also tell the running back to move to pick up a blocker. Those are the, the two things he has to do pre-snap, and let me show you what this looks like. That's how much time you have. I'm going to play you this movie a few times. You've got to look around, look at the defense, and decide to change the play. It moves that quickly. Uh, really hard to do that. So um, we would film on Monday. Derek, uh, Cody, and I would feverishly stitch things together and get VR ready. We put it back in the football office on Wednesday. And then on Thursday and Friday, the quarterbacks would practice. Now, we're not teaching them how to kick and run and throw. They do that on the field. We're teaching them decision making. So look around, recognize the defense. Based on what the defense is doing, Decide if you're going to change the play or move your running back, and then tell the others about it. And that's what we would teach them. Um, Stanford vastly outperformed expectations that season. I would never say it was due to VR. However, Kevin, <laughs> Kevin Hogan, the quarterback, and Coach Shaw both said that it was one of the things that really helped them, Kevin Hogan in particular. So Derek graduates January uh, 1st in 2015, uh, and he forms a company called Striver and proceeds to just shock everybody by signing six NFL teams to multi-year, six-figure contracts, you know, three months after forming the company. Uh, and what began was a journey where Derek is literally, you know, for full disclosure, I'm a co-founder of Striver 2, um, changing the way that athletes train for sports. So I showed you football. I'm now going to tell you the work we do with the U.S. Olympic ski team. Um, so on the mountain in South Korea, every country got three days. That's all you get. And on those three days, you can do the run a bunch of times to practice. Every country cycles through. We convinced the coach to let us film the run in VR. And we produced this run, and our Olympians got to put on the headset for the next year and a half, and we built a little thing they could do their lean, uh, and to be immersed into this scene and to, and to practice. Um, I put this slide in because we are in Detroit. When we work the NBA, you know, you always figure out what works in VR. You do that and you ignore the rest. We did a lot of work on free throw shooting. So there, there's a lot of research um, on visualization, but when you're in a slump, you can't visualize success. It doesn't work. And so what we did is we worked with uh, Ian Mahini and um, the Detroit answer is Andre Drummond, and we filmed them. We spent lots of time in the gym. We filmed them in VR until they got 10 free throws in a row, perfect. Okay? So both of these uh, players are incredible players, but they struggle at the free throw line. So then, before they came out, before every game, they'd put on the headset, and they would watch themselves being perfect, and they got to visualize that. And uh, I don't have data for Andre Drummond, uh, but with Ian, we actually have pre and post data, a uh, major percentage increase based on the VR small sample N of 1, of course, uh, but nice data set. This is a, a screenshot from VR we built for the German national soccer team in the, year, the, the, the era that they won the World Cup, and you're seeing somebody who's about to kick a penalty kick. And uh, for the goalies, what we do is we give them every penalty kick that's filmed, we're now, that's taken, we're now filming, and we get the, them to basically look at the body language and predict left, right, or straight. And for spacing and for understanding uh, for goalies, uh, really special. But the moment, you know, the moment VR history is written uh, on where it really scales, it comes from the uh, Arkansas Razorbacks. So we're in Arkansas, and we're, we've got the football office, and everybody loves football, so um, people come in, and this guy named Brock comes, and Brock runs training for all of Walmart. And Brock puts on the headset, sees the football play, says, huh, looking around, recognizing a pattern, making a decision on what you see and hear, and telling others about it is pretty much what every Walmart associate does every day. 
And so what begins is a journey where we first work in the training academies and we start building VR for Walmart. You may ask, what kind of thing would you do training for Walmart? Uh, and I can tell you, we went through a very large pamphlet and figured out what was going to work in VR and ignored 99.9% .9 of the rest. Here's an example. How many of you guys have been in a store the day after Thanksgiving? <laughs> really hard, right? Holiday rush, we call it. Utter cacophony. People yelling and screaming at you, uh, lines. Uh, we built a VR version of Holiday Rush. Because of turnover, one in two Walmart employees have never experienced Holiday Rush. And so we got them to put on the headsets and basically train how they could cope uh, in such a cacophony. It's very much like football in that sense. Uh, other examples are difficult conversations with a customer. We want you, think of the flight simulator, we want you to make mistakes in VR so that when you talk to an angry customer, you don't. So that was uh, in the academies. We then were confident enough in the efficacy of this medium that we installed, there's 4,700 Walmarts in the US, we installed three or four training systems inside every one of them, okay? So every single Walmart in the US, if you go in the back room, they had three or four VR training systems and employees would go in and they would train. You know, they train for seven minutes once every two weeks. You don't have to do it a lot. It's uh, using VR for very special experiences. Uh, an example of return on investment, this is uh, the pickup tower. It was a new thing they introduced, and Walmart has 1.5 million employees. Every single one of them had to physically come to a store, pay for travel, spend eight hours in order to learn how to use this thing. We built a VR module that was 15 minutes. Okay, so you can do the math there. 1.5 million employees they gained an extra workday plus travel costs for each one of them. So uh, a nice example of return on investment. Um, however, the thing that I will take to the, the end of my career as the most special thing I've been associated with in any work context, uh, we've built active shooter simulations. So when you work for an organization, hopefully you have some training for what to do if a gunman comes through the door. Okay? It's horrible that I have to say that. Hopefully you do. Uh, before we used VR, Walmart was using a PowerPoint. What we did is we built this VR simulation, and uh, you put on the goggles, the gunman comes in, he sticks a gun in your face, starts screaming, shooting, you've got to go try to open the safe or something. It's really intense. It's about 20 minutes. Um, the first thing you do when you take that headset off, you say, oh my God, I, uh, that was hard. The second thing you say is, I can't believe anyone ever trained for this in any other way. Right? So let me talk about some of the things we did. Uh, one of, uh, we did the same thing for Verizon. Verizon gets, there's a lot of armed robberies in Verizon because all their merch is in the front of the store and it's expensive. Uh, one of Verizon's principles is they don't want you to look the gunman in the eye. So what we would do is we'd put you in VR and you would go through it and after about six minutes, we'd say, stop. We'd stop the simulation. We'd say, you were instructed earlier not to look the gunman in the eye, did you? And everyone would say, no, no, I didn't look the gum in the eye. We would then play back their eye gaze as a heat map and say, you looked at it for 60% of the time. Do it again. Do it again. Remember, how we like to train is do, fail, feedback, repeat. You can't do that in any other way. And so uh, in El Paso in 2019, when that horrible <laughs> event happened, uh, we had a number of associates on the floor who had gone through our VR training. Uh, the CEO of Walmart has said publicly that lives are saved because of quick decisions, uh, accurate decisions, and when interviewing employees afterwards, they said they felt like they'd been there before and they'd done it. And so when we talk about dice, this is what we should be using VR for, not reading your email. So to sum up, I disagree with my, respectfully with my colleagues in Silicon Valley that think VR is gonna be the next phone, okay? Phones are phones. You don't need to stick your headset on and have this incredible mental transportation for mundane things with the phone. So as I give you guidelines, I say when you think about VR, think about minutes, not hours. We got a 30 minute rule in my lab. It's okay to go beyond that, it's not strict, but think about minutes, not hours. Uh, we didn't talk about this, but I want you to think about could versus would. Uh, I like to watch zombie movies on TV. In a video game, clicking uh, to play Call of Duty to kill people feels okay. When you're in VR and you take your hand and it's got a virtual knife and you get haptic feedback every time you cut a tendon and then the blood hits you and you feel heat from it, it's a little different. It's a little different. So I'm not trying to say you shouldn't do violent video games. I fully believe in free speech and the Supreme Court has deemed that violent video games are free speech and I support that. 
for all of us in this room, there's something that we wouldn't do in the real world, okay? I don't know what that is for you. What I'm saying is there's something that you wouldn't do in the real world, you shouldn't do in VR. Now, if you couldn't do in the real world, fly to the moon, have at it, that's great. Don't do something that, if you, if you did something in the real world and you couldn't sleep that night because you did it, don't do it in VR. Um, and then just to put a highlight on it, I, I've, I do a lot of work now with lawmakers uh, in our country and they're asking me to prioritize what to focus on first in terms of if, when we regulate VR. And I say, the answer is easy. Your number one, two, three, four, five priority is to ban VR in cars. Like, if one person dies because some jackass is putting on a headset <laughs> to drive a car, that's too many, right? We all agree? Yeah. Okay. Thank you.